Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Optimo Pathfinder is the next generation of financial modeling. Designed specifically for Australian financial advisors, Pathfinder allows you to develop and compare multiple financial strategies within minutes. With cutting-edge optimization and built-in legislation, it removes the burden of time-consuming modeling and report creation. Easy to use and easy to understand. It saves hours of manual work and allows you to turn around financial strategies in a fraction of the time. Take your business to the next level with Optimo Pathfinder. Hello and welcome to this topic series on delivering advice differently. My name is Fraser Jack and in this episode number four of our five part series, we cover demonstration of understanding and how it can empower clients. Now this is a huge topic from your professional obligations to get informed consent to helping the non-CFO in client couples. Uh, If you want to do more than just what's compliant when it comes to your demonstration of understanding, then this episode is a must. Thank you for joining me again, Ben. It is fantastic to be back with you again, Fraser. Well, fantastic, to have, fantastic to have you along. Now, we are talking about uh, demonstration of understanding and empowerment within the advice process. And obviously, a very big part of the advice process is the client putting things in place and understanding the process. Um, obviously, there's some legal parts behind that. Yeah, so we talked in some of the earlier episodes about all the all the laws in the Corporations Act and everything that the regulator requires us to do to comply with those laws. Um, but the important thing ultimately is that the client understands the advice and the client implements the advice and the client sticks with their financial plan. Yep. Now talk to us about the um, about this process because it's been something that has been a bit of a hot topic recently on informed consent and how do you demonstrate and how do you you know provide information uh you know everybody uh, i feel like everybody went to a written documentation and file notes and more words well what are your thoughts so off the back of the fasia code of ethics which had one of the one of the standards um and and we can't use the term fasia anymore because fasia doesn't doesn't exist. So it's the Financial Planner and Advisors Code of Ethics. One of the important concepts in that was ensuring that the client understands the advice that you're providing to them and consents to implementing the advice you provide to them. Um, Understanding and consent don't come... Well, there's a view that understanding and consent comes from clients signing a piece of paper to say that they understand and consent. But the reality is all of us know we have clients who come back later and say, oh, I didn't actually understand that. And in worst case scenarios, clients come back and make a complaint. Um, and that can co- complaint can be sometimes easily dealt with or that c- complaint can sometimes go through external dispute resolution processes and, and worst case scenario court cases. And so anything that you can do to ensure that clients really understand the advice you provide both today and more importantly, potentially in the future um, and and provide ongoing consent because they understand the advice is going to be a benefit to you as a professional and a benefit to you if the client does come back at some point and, and does make a complaint about the advice that you've provided them. Yeah, it seems to be uh, an old... To me, it's an old world way of doing it. You know, you 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 provide a long, 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 long documentation, uh, full of disclosure that says put a wet signature on the end of here to, to prove that you understood. Um, and the longer the document, the the more proof you, that you really can't understand everything in it. But tell us about the the other way. What what what's the other way of doing that when it comes to the, you know informed consent? Obviously, the the next thing that people talk about is file notes, but obviously, I, I sort of think that's only a stepping stone. Yeah, I think this providing long, long, long documents and requiring a wet signature on the end of it is really a lawyer's way of a lawyer's concept of of how do you provide information and and make sure the client has has agreed to it. You you give them hundreds of pages of words and then you ask them for a uh, 
a signature on it. I mean, what you're ultimately trying to get to is is the point where the client understands themselves and understand their goals and objectives, understands the financial plan you're putting in place to achieve them, and then is going out and explaining it to their family and friends at a barbecue this is my financial plan and this is what I'm doing and this is going to ha- is how it's going to help me achieve my goals and objectives and anything you can do to reduce the information asymmetry between the plan that you have have recommended for the client and their understanding and ability to explain that at a barbecue to their their family and their friends is is a benefit to you and so to your point you know one way to do it is is to record file notes um and and provide those file notes back to the client you can go a lot further by actually providing the advice in a format that the client can more easily understand and digest and replay if they need a reminder themselves of what the plan is yeah exactly right now we, we mentioned before the barbecue test or what's commonly known as the pub test and you know what what would consumers actually say about this um i really like the idea obviously of asking the consumer you know what their what their you know how how would they describe that back to their friends at a barbecue uh and then allowing being able to let the the planner to be able to have that conversation but recording that in their own words and i think that's you know a massively missed opportunity Many planners will do it. So again, you'll you'll go through the process of of explaining the strategies and recommendations you're making, and you might whiteboard it, and you might draw it on a piece of paper, or you might just describe it. And you might actually ask the client to to say it back to you to make sure they understand. Particularly in this this post code of ethics world we now operate in, but rarely do we actually let the client make the statement of the advice you're providing to them back to themselves so that you know they can go this is my advice this is my financial plan this is what i am agreeing to to do in relation to how i spend money and how i save money and how i protect myself if something goes wrong explain it back in their own words that they can watch back themselves and and even share with others if they if they want to Talk about it at the pub or at barbecues. Yeah. Now, I want to talk go a little bit deeper just into this exact point because obviously recording a conversation on video, I mean, we're recording a, 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 a conversation right now. Um, we're recording the voice, but there's nuances in voice and, the, and when you record the video as well, there's nuances in the video. Um, confused looks or shaking of heads, uh, you know, um, pauses, awkward pauses of non-understanding, all these sort of things include um, you know, the non-verbal cues are so important when it comes to recording their, their demonstration of understanding, um, that aren't recorded in file notes or, or written, written, you know, texts. Yeah, that's right. I, uh, we were having this conversation earlier, weren't we, Fraser? I was using air quotes, which won't come through in the podcast, unfortunately. But I think that point is, is critically important. And, and particularly when you think about often, Sometimes you've got one client, but sometimes you've got two clients and you're going to have the client that is the one who understands finances better or has more control over the finances in the relationship. But often where the problems occur is with that non, to use a, use a common term, the non-CFO spouse um, or non-CFO partner, the one who doesn't necessarily have as much control. And you need to, it's beneficial to have have a recording and, and see their reaction and see their understanding and see them gaining that understanding over the, the process of the advice being provided and allowing them to see that they understood. Um, often they might understand in the room, but because it's not what they're dealing with day in and day out, they'll forget very quickly so you want to be able to show them actually no you understood this you get this you you can you can do it yeah you mentioned you mentioned that in the pre- one of the previous episodes around the fourth dimension uh throughout time and, and you're absolutely right for somebody to understand at the time is one thing for somebody to remember it um you know six years time when there, there's a complaint or there's something like that people say oh no i didn't didn't understand but to have you know a file note sort of a one thing but to have them on a copy, them have a copy of their video. I guess that probably heads it off at the off the past of them demonstrating that they understood at the time. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this happens to me every year. So I have a financial planner and I have a financial plan. And every year when our insurance premium bills come to to my house and I show them to my wife, she goes, why on earth are we paying this money, this much money for insurance? We don't need insurance. It's jinxing us. It, you know, by paying this, we're actually going to invite the problem happening. And that's not the conversation we had at the time. The conversation we had at the time with the fin- with with my financial planner, our financial planner was, you know, if something happened to us, what do we want in place to to help look after the kids? What state do we want to leave our finances in, uh, in terms of the house and in terms of helping our parents and and brothers and sisters look after our family, uh, if that happens. And, you know, if I probe her, she remembers those conversations, but it takes a lot of time and effort to get her back into that headspace. And so, as I said, this concept of living in the fourth dimension, which is which recording a video and playing that video back to her allows, would have allowed us to go back and go, no, you remember this conversation, you remember saying these things, and it would be a much quicker and easier process for me. But right now, what I have to do is I have to we have the conversation. I have to go to the other end of the house. I have to go to the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet. I have to go all the way to the very back of the filing cabinet. I have to pull out that 150, I think mine's 150 page statement of advice when none of the figures and none of the information really reflects our life today and say, this is why we are paying these insurance premiums. It just takes a lot of time and effort that if I could just show her a video, it would be so much easier. Yeah, and it's, it's absolutely a really good point when it comes to demonstration of understanding and, and empowerment that if you if working with a couple, then, you know, the person who's probably wants to take the least in, interest in the actual conversation at the time, uh, it, you know, is, is across everything and you can make sure that they completely understand what's happening. And- yeah, that's right. I mean, the number of holidays that she could have gone on that I've ruined her life because we've paid these insurance premiums just, you know, it's ruining my life having to have these conversations. So um, I wish my financial planner had provided us with a with a video. <laughs> with a video. Adam, if you're listening. <laughs> uh, ben, thanks so much for coming on and chatting to us in this particular episode. We look forward to catching you in the last episode when we talk about client-centric advice process. I can't wait, Fraser. I'm very much looking forward to it. I'll speak to you next time. Welcome back to this episode four of our five-part series where we're talking around the concept of, you know, demonstration of understanding. We sort of covered off on uh, using visuals and um, in, in the previous episode, we really talked about engagement, but this one, uh, we want to go a little bit deeper and we want to sort of talk about talking about the, the concept of the client's um, you know, understanding you being able to demonstrate that they understand and, and then being able to have these conversations outside, I guess, of the conversation that they have with you. Um, Prashant, this is obviously something that's been on advisors' minds a lot recently with regards to some of the, the legislative requirements. And how, how do you think uh, most people are tackling it? Most people, um, in terms of understanding their advice and making sure the client understands it. I think, I think a lot of uh, traditionally... Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, going through the SOA and showing them everything in that sort of uh, one piece of document. But again, every, everyone knows that's a compliance requirement, but people have tried to make that as a, as best as possible, you know, pretty looking. Some have tried to put more pictures and colors in there and all of that. But what we're finding is... It, like when you basically call, the, call that client one week later in the old model, we find they don't remember what was done. You know, they remember it one hour after or one, two days after, but then one to two weeks after they go, what are we doing again? You know, there's that, that like, because it is too much information given to anyone. I think if we swap roles and if we had, let's say, uh, you know, how many of us have built our own houses? Like if you have, if you think, remember the time that you've gone into that color selection process where the builder goes, oh, here's <laughs> this, here's that, here's that. You come out of that exhausted. And three three weeks later, you don't know what color paint you you, you picked for your house, you know, because you like it, it, it's it's just a lot of, you understood it at that moment, but you forget it because it's just overloading. So um, I think people everyone's doing a very good job trying the best to you know work with the limitations they've gone but um yeah but i think i think that's we found that 
delivering over time makes it more palatable and agreeable and understandable. Um, um, even with that, sometimes, you know, people still go, what are we doing with the insurance thing again? <laughs> you know, it still happens, but, we're, you know, but uh, it's not entirely avoided, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's actually, we're finding it a lot better than the, the old way. Yeah, it's a really good point you raise around the uh, the concept of understanding in the moment versus forgetting about that um, and or being able to recall um, the exact outcomes from that. I guess that happens to a lot of people in a, in a really good analogy with the uh, paint choices. But uh, yeah, it's certainly something that, um, you know, I guess from a business point of view, Michelle, we need to be able to then demonstrate that understanding or that proof point or these were the, these were the things we talked about or the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Prashant's right. There is so much um, complexity and choice in all of this and you come out of the paint shop experience going, what colour was it? Was it the burnt honey or the sunshine yellow? It is complex. And I think, you know, the key is cutting through that complexity, reducing it down to the simple, what are the key strategies and the key things that we're doing? And, you know, we've talked about this before, but backing it up with visuals that are clear and simple and, you know, assumptions that are transparent and and those sort of clear, plain English things that they can take away. Wherever you can back that up with visuals and things that cut through the complexity, I think is really important. And some of that's got to be moving away from the complexity of big onerous statement of advice documents that are impenetrable, written in a legal jargon. And I think there are exciting opportunities as how we can do that differently. Yeah, now Prashant, I know that um, I actually were like some of the stuff that you're doing with regards to um, scoping down these conversations to one specific thing this you know this particular piece of advice is around this one thing and we do this this and this and then give, allowing people to come on a journey that takes you know six to 12 months before everything's sort of set up um, and they move into the next phase T- tell us about how that's gone from the idea of your clients being able to understand what they're doing working on in one particular time and, and place versus um, you know that that whole concept of trying to do a thousand things at once Mm-hmm. Um, I think the I think the experience is is much better. The financial literacy, which we, we which is one of those things we try to measure, is, is getting better uh, because they understand one thing really well. Um, you know, like things like volatility ranges, and you know this. You know, so when let's say the November to now the market sort of tanked a little bit, we had more people calling. We had zero phone calls saying what's going on versus we had more people saying should we start investing now remember we were going to do it should we start it now you know so it was different because they start to understand a little bit more the panic is out because everyone this, you know, the fear of the unknown is, I, I guess, the greatest threat to behavioral change. And I think we, when you sort of do it one thing at a time, you take away the unknown as much as possible. Um, so that's really resulting in clients' confidence, their understanding of it. Technically, at the end of the first year, they kind of know enough to sort of self-manage themselves, their strategy a little bit, you know, but they choose not to. They basically resubscribe. So our resubscription rate is about 80 to 90%. You know, because yeah, so yeah. So just so just on that, you have a twelve month subscription, and then you yes. ask for a resubscription. That's correct. That's correct. So um, it's almost like um, this is what we're working on. Start of the year, end of the year, according to the financial modeling and everything we discussed. These are the targets for the end of the year. We've hit it, or we've missed it by an inch, or missed it by a mile. Let's work on it because what these things don't do is it doesn't show you the bumpiness of the journey. Yeah, 20 years on, yeah, it's a smooth smooth line that way, but it is not going to be as smooth as it looks. So we're helping you with the bumps. We're helping you with everything like that. So there's a clearly defined target to achieve for the year after because the modeling, through that modeling, we've got those parameters that define those things. You know, So there's something to look forward to rather than saying, would you like us to manage you super for next year? You know what I mean? It means nothing to them, to be honest. You know, it's more about here are the thresholds. Let's keep observing. Let's keep changing if we need to. And it just goes on for the next year on. Prashant, how much of the your client process um, is around that, the idea of education when you're talking about, um, you know, bringing your upskill and then we'll let, allowing them to, um, you know, grow as a, you know, to grow their financial literacy along the way? I think... Uh, education plays a very big part, but we don't sort of call it as an education piece. Like, you know, going back, when we talk assumptions going into something, that's education. You know what I mean? There's so many things we do that we can, 
because no one wants to get educated you know what i mean they want to learn you know they don't they want to know it and somehow they want to find it themselves you know what i mean and and it's about just laying everything in that sort of like a video game format to sort of say here's the assumptions you show them something and they will you make them question it and then you teach them and then you sort of tell them and so that's how we do it so if it's a financial modeling to say let's say we're starting an investment program okay and then we're starting say an education bond for their child as a result of this and you know when we talk about it you know we, we say this is how it's going you know everything about why we say this uh, and we when we present it to them they usually ask the questions and the more we allow them to ask questions that's how we respond to those answers so you know uh, just allowing them to ask questions um in that advice phase in that discovery phase you know um i think is where we insert the education element yeah as you're saying that it's kind of like you're telling them or asking them to slow down the process you'd like to say well we could we could dump all this information on you um but you know bringing you along on the journey and allowing you to understand um and empowering you along the way is is a much mm. better process mm. much better definitely I guess, Michelle, you could say that for any business too, for any any relationship-based business. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love um, Prashant's approach in this of, you know, really utilising that subscription model to bake in the education along the way. And, you know, it's that idea of taking people on the journey. Mm. Not, not just, uh, obviously, not just from a client-centric um, set of circumstances, but obviously now this is a more of a compliance issue as well that people are sort of trying to work out how do we, how do we demonstrate that the client you know, came along the journey and understood and wanted to do that uh, at that time. Um, what are your thoughts around that, the idea of, you know, recording that information that your clients understand? How, how, how do you go about that? You know, re, you know, file notes and understanding, as you mentioned before, you use your WhatsApp groups. Um, how do you demonstrate that, you know, or able to demonstrate that to somebody that comes and says, can you prove to me that your clients understood? I'd say the way we track it is, is I guess, uh, unintentionally, it's around how many questions they keep asking. The more questions that they ask, we think that they understand it. it oh, they're getting better at it, you know. I think silence is is the opposite of understanding, you know. So it's more. This is where we go. This is what we're doing. Ask many questions, you know. When you when you sort of pause in that either the advice meeting or the discovery phases or you know f- f- risk profile meeting however you you everyone has their own business thing pause and ask them to ask more questions and 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 i think that's the critical point and you can also tell by the quality of the questions they are asking if they're asking more and more intelligent questions along the way that you know show that they've understood i mean that's a really good indicator absolutely and and i i love the concept of you know, asking quality questions at them too, you know, like asking the questions of, you know, how would you tell your friend at a barbecue about this particular thing or, and, and, you know, and allowing them the time and space to be able to demonstrate to you that they understand without saying to them, you know, do you understand? Yep. No silences, you know, like you mentioned before, what are your thoughts around asking those sorts of questions? So you mean um, asking questions about, do you understand? No, asking questions about, um, that would allow them to then demonstrate. So ask, you know, tell, tell us how you would describe this to a friend at a barbecue. I reckon that'll be amazing. I've never thought about that, to be honest, but I think that'll be, that'll be nice. I think they do. I think they do. I think you'd also find that your, your referral rates will also be a good indication of that too, is that the people are talking about what you do and how you do it and, and they're probably, you know, reciprocating and spilling it out in the other way. I think that's a good, in, that's another good indicator too, I think. Yep. Now, Prashant, one of the things that we you mentioned previously was um, uh, the concept of you know you and your business partner being able to say to your wives that uh, this is the, what we're doing and, and and allowing them to have those conversations using using visuals. But uh, you know, how do you then? Um, so let's say you have got two people in in the office um, and one person clearly understands and the other person's silent. I think yeah, we I normally focus the conversation more on the silent one than the than the the driver seat person you know of course the driver seat person has um usually has most of the answers so to speak or they understand it then they usually um but the silent one is where the the presentation is channelized towards and the pace is all defined by this you know that that slowest uh, person um i think uh, it's more or of that delivery and we intentionally ping them 
when we do WhatsApp messages, we intentionally ping them and say, hey, you know, and, you know, trying to get them engaged and even try to even get them some homework to do kind of thing, little things, you know, can you find this out for me, please? You know, just getting them to sort of get a little bit more outside the comfort zone if, if we can. Um, yeah, little things we do like that, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, one of the other things that uh, we haven't really talked about that you're doing um, is a lot around short videos or just um, explanations mm -hmm. around things. If mm -hmm. you think there might be more information needed or re or required, that's right. I think we finding uh, sending them short, uh, pre-recorded videos of things um, helps the slowest person understand better. Uh, you're finding that they watch it, they can pause it, they can rewind it until the point they can go back and forth. So we've actually started doing more of that pre-recorded video, send it to them on the on the plat on the WhatsApp platform, that sort of thing. So we're finding that uh, really enhancing that um, thing. And most of those tools these days have a, a function that actually says how long they've watched and you know um, things like that. That's your other thing, uh, a, a measure that you can you know point to with understanding and. To an extent, it can, some of these tools actually say who watched it even, you know, depending on the email address that they log in from and little things like that. So, yeah. And Prashant, is that something you tend to do around a particular topic or stage in the process? Like, is it more strategy you'll use the um, videos for or just answering basic questions? Like, when do you use those videos? Anything that requires an explanation for more than two to five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know anything um it's it, one it, it reduces the meeting the need for a meeting it reduces the need to coordinate the time between coordinating between you the the client and availability and uh, you know and all of that so anything that's going to take us more than five minutes to explain goes in a video and what's the sort of feedback you get from customers on that do they like it they love it they love it it's just you could you could find the 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 slow, you know the the person not in the driver's seat being most engaged at the back of those things and it's uh, it's not like they're feeling ignored anymore you know what I mean like uh, they they're not no one wants to feel like that and not, I don't think anyone wants to make them feel like that but I think you know they f definitely feel a bit more empowered and uh, a part of it yeah and having uh, having empowered clients is is pretty important I I think it's sort of um, to do that, it's around really getting that emotional connection as to why we're doing these things and, um, and having that that deep, you know, that that why they're doing them. Do you always sort of finish with that in the conversation? Do you go back to the why? If there's a lack of direction, usually. Um, I think they know the why during the first month and so, but what will happen is after about three to four months into the journey, they sometimes forget it. The noise takes over, you know, um, you know, the, the typical barbecue conversation of uh, I bought this property and I'm doing that. And people come back and say, why don't I do that? And we go, why do you want that? You know, it's you're perfectly fine with just the way you are, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, those times, I think, you know, um, uh, there, there's a little bit of why that keeps coming back to the thing. But I think uh, we definitely incorporate the why towards the end of the journey uh, of the year, just to keep reiterating why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, it's fantastic. And um, uh, just just on the uh, the final piece of this puzzle, I guess um, gaining and gathering that informed consent, and um, you know, keeping it on file. Uh, do you have a process around that, or is that just um, something that you? Uh, it depends on each client. How, how do you sort of record that informed consent? Well. On a meeting point of view, it's file notes. But with our communication methodology, there is not many meetings now. You know, there's high touch points and high level of clarity that's already been logged through the videos we send, through the messaging that happens in this thing. Every single thing is con informed consent. When they say, I want to do this, what's my BSB account number? I need to make this contribution. What's the BPay detail? You know, when they sort of go back and forth on between admin and myself and everything, that's all informed consent right there because we are, are the, the other thing is, I think another way we um, un, uh, unintendedly we managed this is, is we are a do it with you model. We're not a do it for you model, right? So I, when you do it with them, um, they are a part of that co-creation, right? So if they don't understand it, they'd never do it or be in a position to do it. So uh, I think it, it, uh, to us, it was all just lining up one after the other. Yeah, so to me, what you're saying is it's a, it's a whole lot of small incremental steps rather than just one giant leap. Yeah, definitely, yeah. 
And uh, Michelle, from a business point of view, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Fraser, I'm interested to hear, you know, how, how do you hear other advisors do this to get the informed consent in really effective ways? Yeah, it's a, it, it is a, it's been a bugbear for a lot of people trying to work through the possibilities. And I think, um, you know, the, the technology enabling us to get these conversations back, you know, like Prashant's using the WhatsApp, but there's plenty of messaging um, ways that they can happen uh, rather than uh, the old paper signature way, but just being able to understand, you know, get, getting clients to demonstrate that under, understanding. Um, as I said, you know, it, it, by asking good quality questions, if whether it's in a video or recorded conversation or even, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the Zoom or Teams meeting type conversation that people have with their clients and being able to record that conversation so that it took place. It also seems that the video SOA is a good way that people are taking it, you know, because you can record that meeting of the advice being given and you can use, you know, really clear visuals and graphs and plain English cut through the complexity, but you've also got the meeting that shows their understanding through the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And recording of Zoom meetings, I think, is a a big, um, or or Teams meetings or whatever it might be, is, is a big part of your file notes, you know, keeping the notes of the conversation on file by just by just uh, having the recordings and making them available to the client to watch as well. Do you, do you record your meetings, Prashen? Yes, yes. Not all the time, but sometimes. When we know it's a like an advice thing or when we know this is going to be a slightly complex topic and the, and the, and the member would want to revisit this again, we definitely go through that uh, recording bit. Yeah, it seems that technology has got a really big role to play in all of this but, you know, there is also that ongoing onus on making sure that all the advice is really clear and easy to understand and reinforcing that understanding as much as possible. I also think it's really good in that scenario of being able to give the client the, the, the right information, the amount of information that they personally require to make that informed decision whether to proceed or not proceed. So, um, you know, you're absolutely right. You can go, if somebody's not sure or they're not asking questions, you can continue to keep going deeper and deeper into the information and, and, and providing them with access to the information that they require, um, where if somebody knows it and gets it straight away, they can you can move on. Michelle? Absolutely. It's the different personality type. Some people, you know, have a lot of foundational understanding and education and they might need less, whereas some people, you know, want all the detailed charts and reports and analysis and you need to be able to provide that for them. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, Michelle Prashant, thank you so much for being part of this particular episode, episode four. We look forward to catching you in the final episode coming up very shortly. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us again in this episode. I'm looking forward to uh, chatting to you about this actually uh, off the back of our uh, previous conversation around uh, storytelling and telling your clients or narrating your client's story or helping them narrate their story. Uh, and in this particular episode, we're talking about the demonstration of understanding and, and how empowering that is for clients to um, understand how all the different pieces of the, the jigsaw puzzle fit together as part of their story. Um demonstration of understanding can mean a lot of things from a compliance thing through to, you know, the other end of the, the spectrum I see is from the client's, you know, emotional state. Tell us a little bit about what it means to you. Yeah. So the, um, quite often the clients will come in and they'll have a hodgepodge of different things all smattered together and they'll be, um, listening to some, um, their neighbor who's, you know, got different things and they might be working out well for them. And so they, they generally are a little bit all over the place and so that, that's from a financial background so that this could you could say they'd be financially disorganized but they get they're getting by in life they're whatever they earn they spend and they they do their best for their family but there's no overarching um, philosophy there or there's no coordinating structure so so that's part of it but the other what I, I do like to do is to help them be aware of the pitfalls that lie ahead of them. So so they, I, these are what I call the unknown unknowns. And so help them prepare in advance. So uh, that, that's probably something they wouldn't be aware of. Um, and then so to build in that contingencies into their financial plan. Then the next element is to, is to ap- ap- map out a life a plan for them which could extend, I like to go to 100 and then work back. So then they can actually see their life unfolding over many different years. And then we can then actually plot uh, key milestones and then um, financial outcomes for all of those. So that's sort of helping them 
see the picture picture ahead of them, what lies ahead, and help help them to put in a plan to to go on that journey and to complete their story. Yeah, now this is a really interesting, some really interesting words that you use. The first one I've, I've written down here was uh, disorganized and, and obviously the, the emotion of discomfort that comes with that. So automatically you just know that is there and you can sort of highlight the fact that you've you've heard them or listened to them or seen them, you know, with that scenario. Um, and then obviously, you know, you go back and look through the pitfalls and you can think about what's, what could be a worry in the, in the, in the, in the future. Um, and then, yeah, planning planning with them to see the future, and that's I think that's a pretty powerful thing. Yes, it is, and I think that's the that's a value add as a financial advisor is to. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to be a hindsight hero here, so I know that's a bit political, but I do like to look into the future for, on their behalf and help them be prepared. That's that's a key part of what I do. It's not historical, reactive. Um, tax-driven strategies, uh, but it's actually looking forward and giving them the benefit of hindsight. Yeah, it's a great term, hindsight hero. Maybe you can you can coin that one. Uh, <laughs> so t- tell me what that what, what what's the difference with that? You know, like so obviously you're focusing on the fact that you're there to help them build their story. Um, in in a way, when you start looking at the uh, if we go forward to the future and we say you, you know these are all the milestones and the, the key milestones along the way, you're sort of giving them a sneak peek into the um, you know the, the spoiler alert of their own story, <laughs> uh, if if you like. That's, uh, I mean, we, we sort of, we can see that the benefits of that. Then tell us around, um, tell us then how we go to, um, you know, the actual advice itself and the demonstration of understanding of that advice as to, and not just understanding the advice, but understanding how the advice fits into their story. Yeah, I guess a key part of that is helping them flesh out their their goals and and what they might like to do in the future. So that's, and then, so it, you do come back, Back to those and re-measure and test those every year. So this is not a financial test. This is more of a how well you're using your money to live your life test. So it's re-evaluating those every year, and then and also but resetting those um, long-term plans and reviewing them uh, as they become more real uh, closer to reality. So there's uh, two types of assets we're dealing with, and this is throwing back to my accounting days with tangible and intangible assets so we're working on both as part of their ever-evolving story yep now you mentioned there that uh that part of this is the journey along the way it's not Mm. just about getting to the end of you know a milestone and then being in a certain position uh it's about enjoying that does that mean you're asking them along the way around how happy they are at, at the moment or how you know that you're asking them about those intangible emotional pieces of their life not just their um throughout the journey, not just, um, you know, at retirement or at a milestone or at a goal end? 100%. Yeah. So I I, uh, I really enjoy that side. So this is, you know, um, way outside of the uh, technical person's comfort zone. And that's where I've come from. So that's what it's all about is how well are you using your money to enjoy life and and looking at areas where they may not be as happy as they could be. And, and then what can we do about that? It, it's up to them, obviously, but I just provide the platform for them to ask those questions and, and consider. Yeah, now, and, and I get to, as part of this conversation with you, I'm getting to see you visually, uh, albeit we're online, uh, <laughs> but I can actually see that that, uh, that actually that lights, that lights you up inside as a human being, that part of the, the role, not just about the client being happier. It does, yeah, because I, I actually feel like uh, a lot of people uh, do. They may they they do work hard. They do, do all the right things, and they uh, go to get a good education, then earn a high income, but not necessarily doing what they really want to do, uh, and in, and in getting quite a high level of satisfaction from what they're doing. So it's about that side of it so actually it's it's about their life not what someone else thinks they should be doing 
Yes, exactly right. And it, it's also becoming very clear why you you take, you know, five to six meetings to, <laughs> to work this through because obviously there's a, there's a lot more to it than just the financial advice piece. Um, do you see this as a little bit of coaching as well or is this a, rather than just advice? Or how, how do you see yourself as a, you know, a strict, you obviously come from a, a very technical background, accountant and, and legal side, uh, and then, and now you're doing financial planning, but do you see yourself as way more than any of those professions? I, I, I see this as, you know, good financial advice. It just happens to make, it's on the foundation of really um, their, what their life uh, life goals are, what, what's really important to them. It's just, I think this is the way it should should be done. I, I certainly don't see myself as anything extraordinary. I certainly don't want to be in the camp of a life coach, but it's financial advice, which is, it's a bit like having your life planned and using your financial strategies to help you achieve that. So they're interconnected yep. and also on the foundation of your estate plan. So it's, I see this as really good comprehensive financial advice. Yep. Fantastic. Now, if your clients were at a barbecue describing what you do, how would they, <laughs> how would they describe it? I think they would probably say on, on the, uh, I would say, Jeff gives financial advice, uh, but he's he's very strong on estate planning. I, I, I'm not sure if they would be able to <laughs> give me a good barbecue pitch, but uh, I, I think they would say he's very good. He's very thorough, and he makes sure your estate plan's up to date. So. Yeah. Or you okay, need a will go and see him. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what he does, but you need to go see him. It's good. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for opening uh, up and telling us a little bit more about how you work with uh, helping your clients um, design and live their story. I uh, really appreciate it. I look forward to catching you in the final episode when we uh, catch up shortly. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, Fraser.